Okay. Um, we can go ahead and start. So I see that we still have people coming in. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you for those who are attending tonight's uh, presentation for our parent university initiatives with District 76. Um, tonight's topic, um, and I will let Maria, you know, give her introduction in a little bit. Today's topic um, is we're going to cover um, supporting our students' mental health. Um, and this initiative really rolls out based off of a parent interest, uh, parent survey interest survey that we sent out district wide um, to all of our families in both English and Spanish. And across the board, we saw, you know, that a lot of our parents wanted to learn more about supporting uh, their child's mental health. Um, last year we gave, um, you know, Maria actually gave a presentation on parent self-care and well-being. Um, this year, you know, we're learning um, about supporting our uh, children's uh, mental health. Um, and again, I guess, you know, the reason for that is just to learn uh, how to better support our students and to build that home and school relationship, which, you know, it's just very, very beneficial. And as a reminder, also, at the end, we will have time for Q&A um, and open discussion. Um, there is a brief survey at the end. Um, we have a QR code. It's just three short questions. Um, and that just lets us gauge um, that just lets us gauge, um, you know, just feedback and then also other presentations that you would like to see. Um, and if you found, you know, tonight's presentation beneficial or not, like I said, it, we just finished, you know, our six o'clock session um, and that conversation just kind of kept rolling. So that was great. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, for now, I will let, um, you know, Maria give the introduction. We can go ahead and get started. Great. Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I am really excited to be here today talking about this very important topic. Um, so before we get started, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Maria Rocha. I am a licensed clinical social worker and a mental health therapist, and I work with children, adolescents, and adults um, working on uh, bettering their mental health. So again, this topic is just really, really important talking about children's mental health um, at school, um, changes that they've gone through at school and how parents can support. So we'll talk about all of that in the presentation. Um, as Daisy mentioned, there'll be time at the end for Q&A. So throughout the presentation, please feel free to add any questions, any comments, and the presentation will be followed by um, that open discussion. So I will go ahead and share my screen now. So bear with me here. Okay, it's perfect. So we will start here with talking a little bit about um, the impact of COVID-19 on children. So obviously last school year, right, was a little hectic with transitioning to remote learning. Um, likewise this year, I'm sure with transitioning to back to in-school learning. Uh, but what I'd like to take a moment is just talking a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 specifically on children um, with the focus of what the presentation will be on. So first and foremost, children have had at the beginning of this pandemic, vital support interrupted by the pandemic, school, healthcare services, sports, other community supports. And then now we're dealing with some return to school struggles, which includes struggles with organization, time management, and socializing. There's also some pandemic related stress and traumas um, that children could have gone through that have lasting effects on their developing minds, which includes, you know, any financial stress that the, took a toll on the household, um, any illnesses of family members or loved ones, or even deaths of family members and loved ones during the pandemic. So it's really important to continue to check in with your child often and watch and listen for signs that they are struggling. Signs of stress and mental health challenges are not the same for every child or teen, but there are common symptoms, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, we're going to talk about the signs um, of stress in young children and in adolescents, because as we know as parents, children don't always come to parents when they're struggling with things, unfortunately, right? And so there are other ways that a parent can observe um, to see, you know, that their child might be going through a tough time. 
So for children specifically, this may include regression, um, which is backwards progress in skills and develop my, developmental milestones. So this can include, and again, these are our younger children. So this can include a regression back to baby talk or a regression, you know, back to bedwetting where the child was potty trained. So that type of regression. Other signs include irritability, um, maybe crying a little more easily or being more difficult to console, falling asleep and waking up more during the night, but just overall um, difficulty with sleep. Separation anxiety, seeming more clingy, socially withdrawn or hesitant to explore or fear of going outside where this fear or hesitance did not exist prior. Hitting, frustration, biting, and more frequent or intense tantrums. And again, as I mentioned, with regression bedwetting after the child has been potty trained. Some signs of stress in older children and adults uh, looks a little different. So this includes changes in mood that are not usual, um, ongoing irritability, feelings of hopelessness or rage, and frequent conflicts with friends and family. So changes uh, in behavior, such as stepping back from personal relationships or showing little interest in spending time with friends. So this could be with texting or video chatting. If you're seeing a decrease in some of these activities and it's kind of out of the ordinary, that can be um, a sign. Loss of interest in activities that were previously enjoyed. Uh, again, difficulty with sleep, changes in appetite, weight or eating patterns, problems with memory, with thinking or concentration less interest in school and a drop of academic effort, changes in appearance or lack of personal hygiene, increase in risky or reckless behaviors such as drugs or alcohol, or thoughts about death or suicide or talking about it. So now if your child does display one or more of these signs, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're in distress, but it could signal that there, there could be something that's bothering them. Right, and as a parent, if you're also observing any other changes within their life that go hand in hand with some of these signs, um, you know, it, it, it may be um, something to look into. So if you do see these signs, what do you do? First and foremost, it's important to stay in touch with the pediatrician. So now we're talking about how do we support our children who may be going through a tough time. So staying in touch with the pediatrician is gonna be really important. Can go to them with any concerns that you have. They can do a social and emotional health check on children. They have age appropriate screenings for depression, anxiety, and coping with stress. Obviously, it's a pediatrician's office, right? Not a therapist's office. So it's going to offer these screenings and only these screenings. But from there, they would be able to provide you with other resources if they're recommended for the child. Now, how can we support our children at home? So some children or adolescents may need more time and space to express their feelings. Some do better with gradual conversations and other activities besides talking, right? This could include painting, drawing, journaling, other avenues to be able to express themselves and manage their stress. Um, and then again, there will be others that are more comfortable with just direct conversation as well. So it all just really depends on the child. Another thing to do at home on behalf of the parents is going to be to welcome all of the feelings under the rainbow, right? So no stigma with any of these feelings, um, whether they're positive ones or not so positive ones, right? So not just inviting emotions of happiness and excitement and joy, but also inviting those not so good feelings emotions like sadness, frustration, and anger, they're all welcome. Um, and so that's an important first step too. Um, the other piece that I'm going to focus on today is helping your child build resilience. So what is resilience, right? So resilience is the ability to cope with challenges, to deal with negative feelings, and bounce back after something negative has happened happen, whether that be a tough situation or a difficult time. So parents can help their children build the ability to bounce back from difficult situations by giving them the opportunity to learn and practice the following values. So today we're going to focus on those four specifically for building resilience, and they include self-respect and other personal values and attitudes, uh, social skills, helpful and optimistic thinking, 
and skills for accomplishment. So all young people can build resilience. And as parents, we have a big role in helping them to build that. So um, resilience in young people is built on a foundation of strong and positive relationships with parents. Um, children can also gain the strength from other caring adults that they identify with, whether it be grandparents, aunts, uncles, or teachers. Um, with that being said, being connected to school also helps build resilience. Um, and friends and classmates can also be a great source of support for, for the child. So we'll start with talking about self-respect, right? So building self-esteem, this is very, very important. And it comes from being listened to, being treated respectfully, and by having children's accomplishments recognized, but also having their mistakes acknowledged and accepted. So I feel like oftentimes the latter isn't always done, um, but it is equally important to acknowledge and accept the mistakes as it is to praise those accomplishments too as young children. Empathy and respect for others are also linked to resilience. So if your child has self-esteem, they believe that they matter, right? When a child has self-esteem, they believe that they matter and that they should be treated respectfully by others. Um, also, they're more likely to protect themselves by avoiding risky behaviors and situations. Um, strong self-esteem will also help a child be less vulnerable to bullies and to bullying. And this includes, um, you know, with building self-esteem, personal values and attitudes, it includes showing care and concern for people um, who, need, who need it, um, supporting and accepting other people's differences and treating others with kindness. So we'll talk a little bit about empathy and kindness in a moment here. Um, but these attitudes and behaviors towards others are likely to get a positive response in return as well. So we continue here with social skills. So these are the skills needed to make and keep friends, to resolve conflict and to cooperate and work well in a team. So when a child has good relationships and they have more chances to develop connections and a sense of belonging, right? And this includes at school, whether it's with sports or extracurricular activities, um, outside of school by getting involved in community groups, sports teams outside of school, other organizational sports activities outside of school, and activities that include the arts. And so this is where with social skills, empathy and kindness go hand in hand also. So teaching your children empathy towards others, kindness towards others, um, you know, diversity, accepting other people's differences. Um, is, is all very important with this area of building social skills. Equally important too is having a strong family support system to help children get through the inevitable, tough, the inevitable tough times that they will deal with socially and with peers. We move on to helpful and optimistic thinking. Um, so resilience is about being, is about being realistic about thinking clearly and looking at the bright side and finding the positive in things, expecting things to go well and moving forward, forward even when things go bad. So oftentimes when, when we're upset, whether it's a child or an adult, um, we tend to let our emotions get the best of us, right? And we kind of sometimes forego the facts and reality-based thinking and our emotions are just taking over. So again, when your child is upset, as a parent, we can help keep things in perspective by focusing on facts and reality. And so there is a link here to an exercise that does just that very, very well. Um, some of those questions though in that worksheet include taking a breath and asking the child, what are you worried about will happen? Like what really is it that's bothering you? Another question can be, is it worth getting this upset about it? And the third question here could be, on a scale of one to 10, how bad is it really? Now, again, these prompts are just to help keep, keep things in perspective and focus on facts and reality when in these situations, our emotions take the best of us. So another great way to help um, kind of you know manage mental health. And again, there's a great worksheet on that that you would be able to access on here as well. 
So again, children are more likely to feel positive if they can see that difficult times are a part of life and that they'll pass and that things do get better. As, as, and as parents, um, it's our job to show them that. All right, we move on here um, to some other tips for helpful and optimistic thinking. Um, and it, it definitely it makes a great point. So no matter how upbeat a child may be, there will be times that they feel anxious and scared and angry. Again, all feelings are welcome, right? Even the negative ones. So here are some tips on how to turn low moods into better moods, right? So it includes doing things that you love and enjoy, spending time with friends. Again, it's just doing more positive things that we might not be inclined to do in moments of distress, but it's worth mentioning and learning now that it's going to be so helpful to be able to do these things in those moments. In therapy, we call that opposite action, right? If you're feeling angry or sad, we tend to do things that keep us angry and sad, right? We isolate, we detach from people, we stay alone. And that's only contributing to sadness and frustration. Opposite action is really important. And here's a little bit of that. So again, um, if a child who's any child really, but they're feeling anxious, scared, or angry, you can maybe make a list of these activities that they can turn to and try to do in those moments to help change the mood a little bit. We move on here to skills for accomplishment. Um, so this includes um, providing your child with opportunities to take on new experiences and master new skills, allowing them to make, make mistakes and be patient and cheer them on. So again, competence increases confidence, but you don't get competent in something unless you practice a lot. And in practice, there's going to be errors as well. So some important skills for accomplishment include goal setting, planning, being organized, and self-discipline. So parents can help children work out their strengths and limitations, encourage children to set goals for themselves, and change those goals, right? As life changes, you might need to alter those goals a little bit, and that's okay. Encourage children to put their strengths into action and help them focus on what they're good at. And so again, strengths are very important, but so are those limitations, right? It's equally important for a child to know what they're great at and what other areas that they may need to improve on. So focusing on both is going to be very important. Um, and again, as mentioned a little bit earlier, supporting your child to take on a new or extra responsibility is a great way to build their confidence and a sense of what they can do. And again, this all just contributes to helping um, build and develop that resilience in our children. All right, so we continue here with a couple skills and strategies that I wanted to share with you all for anger and stress. And again, this is for children, but adults can definitely benefit from it too. Um, but I've definitely seen success with these strategies in my, um, the at children, teens, and adolescents who, who I work with. So the first is deep breathing, um, which I think is essentially important here. So um, as we've all been through, right? During periods of stress or anxiety, um, our body triggers a set of sim symptoms, right? Called stress response. This is where the breathing becomes shallow and rapid. Our heart rates increase and our muscles become tense. The opposition to that stress response is called the relaxation response. This is where breathing becomes deeper and slower. The symptoms of anxiety fade away. And deep breathing is what triggers this response. So again, I have a link here um, to a worksheet that talks only about deep breathing and how to do it. Um, but basically you inhale slowly through your nose for four seconds and you then hold that breath for four seconds and then you exhale slowly through the mouth for six seconds. And now at the beginning, you do this for about two minutes at a time to practice. Once you master it, um, it's such a portable coping skill for stress. You can use it anywhere. And you do deep breathing. You do those rounds until you feel a sense of calm. The other coping skill here that I want to share with you all is called anger iceberg. Um, and this one I, I use a lot with both children, younger children and adolescents, because you can really teach it to, to a kid at, at any age here. So the anger iceberg, let me actually show it here. I'm sharing the screen. I'll, I'll go back to the other one. 
Um, but it basically represents the idea that although anger is displayed outwardly, other emotions may be hidden underneath the surface, right? And so these other feelings such as sadness, fear, or guilt might cause a person to feel vulnerable, or they may not have the skills to manage those feelings effectively, right? So by exploring what's beneath the surface, children can gain insight into their anger and other possibilities of treatments or resolution, right? So they're, they might find that they're not angry just to be angry, but they're actually sad. Okay, well, what's making you sad, right? Can, can we resolve it? Or what's making you feel embarrassed? Can we talk about it or resolve it? Um, so I feel that this strategy is so, so, so important, again, for anyone, but specifically for, for children here. So again, Anger, for example, fueled by jealousy may be resolved with communication skills, right? Or a child who realizes that they're angry because they're stressed out will benefit from developing self-care habit. What I often recommend is that parents print these coping skills out, either have them in a central area of the house or provide them to each of the children and talk about them, right? And so now you're giving them the resources to be able to resolve a tough situation on their own, right? Or at least think about a tough situation, think about anger differently, um, learning how deep breathing will help them um, naturally bring down that stress response that's being triggered by stress or anxiety. So the link to that anger iceberg strategy is there for you all as well. Um, I want to take a moment to talk a little bit about self-care also as another way to help support positive behavior in children. Um, and so the three areas that I'm going to talk about specifically here are sleep, nutrition, and physical activity. Um, so it's important for us to get sleep, right? For children to get sleep um, because they're still developing and it's a chance to just kind of you know, re-energize, give the body and the mind a break. So here for three to five-year-olds, the recommendation is 10 to 13 hours per night, and this includes napping. For six to 12-year-olds, this include this, the, the goal is nine to 12 hours. Ages 13 to 18, the goal is eight to 10 hours. And for adults, the goal is seven to nine. And I have adults on here. I have parents on here because again, parents taking care of themselves helps model positive well-being for your kids, right? If your kids see you prioritizing yourself in these ways, they're going to um, want to prior prioritize these things for themselves too, or at least there's a better chance for them to want that. Um, secondly here, nutrition. So nourishing our bodies with healthy foods, eating a balanced diet and eating regularly, um, having a schedule for meals, maybe eating every two to three hours to help maintain blood sugar levels and energy levels. Um, nourishing our bodies helps to improve mood, maintain concentration and improves productivity. Lastly, here we have physical activity level or exercise. So many forms of exercise are said to have positive effects on stress. Um, helping release endorphins that reduce our feelings of anxiety and also trigger positive feelings. So sharing a little bit of, or engaging in some self-care activities is definitely going to go a long way in helping um, managing stress and mental health, both for children and for adults. Um, again, as I mentioned, parents modeling self-care is going to be helpful to the child, right? Parents set the tone in the household. Expressing extreme doom or fear can affect our children. It can be challenging to stay positive, especially if you're struggling with your own stress, but try to stay positive and relay cons a consistent message that a brighter future lies ahead. That's gonna go a long way um, for our children. Set aside time to take care of yourself and seek support for your own mental health as parents, if needed. Um, practicing mindfulness, right? Focusing on the present moment and maybe even building in some downtime for the whole family to connect and relax, whether that be watching a movie or just another way of spending time with each other. Um, Self-care definitely is really essential here. All right, so that brings us to the end of that presentation. We're gonna open up a spot for Q&A. Here's that survey that Daisy had mentioned earlier. Um, and then it's also followed by um, a slide here for other resources that you might find helpful. Again, this PowerPoint is gonna be available and you'll be able to access it. Um, 
but I just wanted to run through those slides and there's the link to that, that survey that was mentioned earlier. If you guys can please take a moment and complete it. Thank you right. so much. Mm -hmm. So we'll open up Q and A now if anybody has any questions or comments. Um, I mean, even if it's not necessarily related to the topic, um, you know, keep in mind that, you know, this is an opportunity just to kind of, you know, ask questions and try to learn a little more about mental health overall. Thank you so much for that presentation. Yeah, like she said, we're, we're gonna keep this up for now. Um, I love the presentation. I, you know, like I, like I shared, it was, um, and, and while I'm talking, feel free to think of questions um, to ask for any comments um, in the chat. But, um, you know, we sent out this parent survey interest because we're like, all right, what do you guys want to know about? And, you know, we will tackle different topics. Um, we will tackle different topics throughout the school year and, you know, provide different presentations, different events, different supports and resources for all of our families. Um, and that's just kind of how we tackle educational equity within District 76. But um, one thing that we saw was um, our parents wanting to know how to support, you know, children's mental health because it's just been a challenge transitioning back to in person. Um, you know, and I think, you know, for everyone, but, you know, my takeaways for, from this presentation, and I shared them, like, you know, within the Spanish one as well, um, it's, you know, modeling that self-care as parents, um, you know, for, for our children, um, and, you know, just that positive behavior <laughs> and um, being consistent, staying organized and self-disciplined, uh, self just, like, a huge takeaway from, um, from that. Um, let me see. And I can also share in a little bit, um, you know, some of the questions that we had in the other session, see if that sparks any conversation <laughs> here. Um, but feel free for now, if you are in, uh, you know, to take a picture, screen shoot, this will be, this presentation will be available on our website under our parent university section. Um, again, it's, it is a short survey. I believe it's only three questions and that's just for us to gauge, you know, was this beneficial? Do you, did you find it beneficial? What other topics would you like to hear um, about in the future? <laughs> Oops, sorry about that. Um, again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat. <laughs> this resource will be available on our website. Um, some of the, one of the questions that I guess just to share with um, our parents now in this session um, that we talked about at the, at the six o'clock, somebody shared, you know, that um, their student kind of just, her personality changed a little, changed a little bit during um, the pandemic and learning at home, and she really relied on her son, who also had to focus on his own, um, you know, schoolwork. Um, you know, she asked like, what additional supports um, does our school district give? And I just, and I shared with her um, that, you know, to tackle, you know, learning loss, what we're calling learning loss right now. Um, because of the pandemic, we, we do have after school activities that we're offering and then to always consider summer school um, as another option. Um, we always have those resources and just different groups available um, to support our students at um, different grade levels and building levels. Um, and then actually somebody shared with us that their six year old. Um, what was it that she shared that their six year old, I believe, uh, there was a there was a situation at school like being bullied at school. Yeah, and he and he said something to 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 his parents <laughs> and you know they were in the call. Um so you know we were just kind yeah. of teaching them and just like, you know, they're modeling behavior. So it was it was great for them to have that open for him to to come to them and let them know that let his parents know that there was a, a an issue going on at school. Um, 
Yeah, I think that was very brave of of the six year old to tell his parents because I think that's the struggle right now with kids right at any age is that they don't often share the struggles that they're going through at home, which is why um, you know I focus a lot on what are some of the signs, right? Because not all children are going to tell us what's going on. And sometimes we have to observe changes to to see that something you know might might be a little off with with what they're going through. So no, I think that was great that that child was able to go to their parents and come to some sort of resolution. So yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and I didn't even think about that, the iceberg activity, um, the PDF mm -hmm. that you shared um, during the six o'clock session also, but you know, it's kind of like, there's always something beneath the surface as a reason to why people, you know, or children behave a certain way that they do. And then that's, there's that, empathy point that you discussed also where it's mm -hmm. kind of like you know some an interaction happened with another student um mm -hmm. there's always you know something deeper beneath the surface whether that's you know issues at yeah. home. um so absolutely yeah and that's why I definitely um enjoy that activity in, par in particular because you know oftentimes especially with, with kids and their young minds anger is just anger right it takes a lot of digging to say okay you're angry but why are you angry why are you so upset right and so that anger iceberg activity really helps dig to think okay yes yeah, sure I'm expressing anger but what's really bothering me? And so I feel like it just really gives one empowerment, right? To say, okay, no, this is what I'm dealing with. I'm not angry just to be angry. I'm actually tired, right? Or I'm actually frustrated. And so it gives, in this case, children a chance to kind of resolve um, their own anger, um, which is very, very helpful. And I think, um, again, that the other strategy that I, I didn't talk too much about, but it's that de-escalation. When we're going through tough times or a stressful situation, again, our emotions take over. It's hard to think straight and think clearly. We see red right away, right? That's often the expression is I see red. And so that, um, that exercise of decatastrophizing, asking those questions um, really helps center us and think, okay, no, let me let my emotions take the back seat and think logically about the situation, feelings aside, what's going on. And so that really helps. And I think, again, we teach these tools to children at a young age and they have a lot more time to develop them, right? Um, again, learning them as adults is also very beneficial too, but learning them as children just gives them ample time to master it and to, again, better be empowered and take hold and ownership of their mental health. So so yeah, if you guys can get a chance, print those out, share them um, with your children and they might not get it right away and that's okay. They're still learning, but it'll be a good resource for them to have nonetheless. No, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we'll give just a couple of minutes if there are any uh, comments or questions for Maria or even myself as part of um, you know school district um, on our behalf, feel free to um, enter them in the chat. Um, Again, these efforts are just to help us bring more resources. In this case, it's that mental health support for our students, for, for all of our families, um, for ultimately like our district 76 student success, right? And anybody else that they share these strategies with. Mm -hmm. And I guess I have a question for you, Daisy. Have you guys seen um, like counseling services or social work services increase now that you've gone back to in-person? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's, you know, just um, in the beginning of the school year, I sent out a survey um, and it was just a student needs survey for all of our parents. What supports do you need? Right. When we yeah. had um, a school supply drive. So it's like we can. We were able to um, to offer materialistic things like, yeah. you know, all of that, but at the same time, um, just bridging that gap for um, SEL support, social emotional learning support. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a lot of what we saw was, you know, I would like my child to um, to interact more with peers her age. So for that, um, mom, we brought back actually at the intermediate school, which is grades three, four, and five. There's girls on the run now, so there's a student okay. for that. 
Um, so, you know, just having that relationship also with staff, I reached out to one of the teachers that run it and I was like, Hey, is this, you know, how are, how is this being sent home? Can we make sure that we have this, you know, for the students? She's like, Oh, she was a part of it last year when it was virtual. Um, you know, and now okay. back, back in person. So, um, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I genuinely appreciate the fact that we have, you know, those groups, those after school activities now. Um, but those, yeah, just to, you know, to answer your question, we did see, um, I would like my child to see, you know, social workers. So we have social workers at each school and then we have our school psychologist for the whole district. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was very, it was very interesting transition mm -hmm. to see. It's like, yeah. you know, you can try to predict what it back to school is going to look like in person. But I think that mm -hmm. once it actually happened, it was kind of, um, that was just a big trend. And, and that's why, you know, this presentation was important because that's what my parents wanted to learn about. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah. and it was the most requested, uh, it was the most requested topic, like I said, in both English and Spanish, like for all of our parents. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, no, hopefully, um, you know, they'll, they'll have benefited from, from the presentation, just, you know, a few takeaways. I mean, again, this topic is just so, so broad, right? So to kind of like chop it down for a half hour presentation is a little tough, but um, I feel that again, in my experience, what I've been um, working with the, the children and adolescents who I work with, I feel like this piece was very fitting, especially in such an unprecedented time right now with going from remote, remote learning from an entire school year for an entire school year transitioning back to in-person. So definitely unique times we're in right now. And you kind of just have to, you know, roll with it day by day. Like you said, you can't prepare for this. We don't know what to expect, but um, hopefully um, this will have been of help. Yeah. At least. Mm -hmm. So, all right. I don't see any questions or comments, but um, I always want to thank the parents that um, are a part of this, that were part of the other session as well. I praise them so much. I think I told you, Maria, also, you as a parent yourself. Um, <laughs> that, you know, just thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, I think that you are a great example, both personally and professionally, and, you know, you give these, uh, give this advice and, um, and it's great just to have you as a resource. And so I praise you and I give, and, and I thank you. And then I thank all of our parents that are part of this session, because it just, it, it just shows, um, how caring and that above and beyond, um, to support our students and, and your children, how involved you guys are. So I, I, I praise our district 76 families. 110 percent mm -hmm. um somebody just somebody in the chat um thank you for opening up the conversation and addressing this important topic thank you for the strategies and advice uh and advice giving um thank you for attending um i know she's a active pto member she's a pto president actually so that is great but i love i love seeing that i love seeing the interactions the questions the <laughs> feedback etc but um all right, if we don't have any more questions, thank you so much. Again, this presentation is uh, is going to be on our District 76 YouTube page. The presentation is going to be linked under Parent University uh, website. So you can access the PDF, um, all of the resources and the survey if you're able to take that as well. Um, so thank you guys all for attending and thank you, Maria, so much for your time. Yeah, no, thank you guys. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye.